So, a new, uh, new tax scheme that talked a year and a half ago, I guess? Two years. Two years, two years. So, so a lot of changes since then. So, uh, so he can give more details about this project. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, this is the last talk. I'm going to learn about architecture, so I'll try to make it not so boring as much as I can. So my name is Milon. I lead uh, uh, design and architecture across all the sort of areas of the world, one of them being uh, data architecture. I'm also the co-creator for Apache UV. So today, uh, actually what we'll do is we'll try to dive into data architecture. Specifically, we'll try to spend some time on data leaks, which I'm sure like most of you have heard about. And we'll look at some requirements for actually building a harness data lake, which is sort of uh, something that I spend a lot of time on at Uber. And we'll introduce the Apache the Huri project, which kind of helped us implement the data lake and see how the, the requirements fit. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, we find this one. Um, all right, let's dive in. So I get this asked a lot. OK, how hard can it be? You have a bunch of services emitting events into like a queue like Kafka and then you have some databases, some external sources. All you need to do is ETL them onto your favorite HDFS or cloud storage and then run queries on it. So it sounds very simple. It is simple as long as you're doing you know, a few of these ETLs. But uh, when there are other things, as even, even when you start to scale it to like tens of these pipelines, um, you know, your ETLs change, so you'll keep going back to these sources to change your logic and backfill. Your database admin won't be happy with you. Um, you probably don't have any data quality checks at this point. You probably want to schematize your data so that you have some, uh, you know, data quality and then you data loss guarantees. And then, uh, then typically there is the data lake architecture uh, where you first try to now, instead of doing a single stage, you first ingest the data, schematize it, high quality as a bunch of raw tables, and then try to do your ETLs on top of this. Um, so suddenly this has gotten a little bit more complicated, right? But when you actually uh, try to implement one, you have to deal with a whole uh, bunch of complexity. Um, which is sort of what we went through uh, at Uber, and a lot of these requirements we funneled into, distilled into some system that we can build, and that's kind of how we started at Uber. Um, yeah, so if you start heading into hundreds of ETL pipelines, so we have 4,000, 5,000 of these raw data sets, and like more are uh, more of those derived data sets from that. So to actually manage these things, you need very strong primitives in your data lake. So I'm literally going to tell you 10 things that you need to care about when building data lakes. Uh, since everyone knows about data lakes, let's, let's look at what these things are. Um, I think every company has few uh, very critical and kind of high value data sets. Uh, like for Uber, it's like trips, uh, transaction logs, typically stored in some, say, user information, stored in some, say, MySQL database. What you need to do is, as users do, uh, CRUD operations against them, you need to replicate them to your data lake with strict ordering guarantees and zero data loss, right? And uh, the another thing is, uh, I, is something I found, find uh, still people do is people still do bulk loads of databases because it's, it's easy, but they don't scale, and then they lead to a lot of inefficiency. So you need to figure out a way to incrementally ingest your databases. So, um, I'm pretty sure like all of you are emitting events from your uh, microservices, uh, sort of billions, millions, you know, aggregate them, and uh, you know, some some cases now you emit transactional events, so there will be lots of duplicates because client retries, multi DC architectures, failures, and you need to do uh, deduplication of these uh, events before you ingest them in the data lake because typically. Uh, you know, we still are ruled by the Lambda architecture where we can do streaming computations, but we finally rely on the data lake to correct those data. So this has to be like, you know, of high quality, right? So in this case, you can see, you know, there are impressions in Kafka which you need to replicate your data lake without, without duplicates. So you need to solve this problem. And any data that you write, you need to now 
uh, do some transactional guarantees on it. This, this wasn't the case before. Uh, it used to be that only data warehouses sort of provided this kind of transactional guarantees. But if we have to now use data lake to do critical back and processing, uh, you, need, you need atomic publish, uh, your ignition can fail midway, you need to, you can have a, a batch of bad data, you need to roll, roll it back, you need some consistency guarantees, you can't expose like partial data, your queries have to be repeatable uh, so that analysts can actually, you know, work on an analysis uh, without getting like, you know, kind of like really jumpy results. And uh, you need to be able to take in data and allow readers, so sort of like have some uh, concurrency and of course strong, strong durability. Uh, the other thing is uh, unique key constraints. So your database probably, MySQL is very good at maintaining like a primary key uh, constraint to say okay, this is one uh, user record for this user ID. Uh, and then you, you sort of need that too. Uh, the reality is uh, the database is actually very good for sort of large scale uh, backend processing. For example, I'm going to scan over all the transactions that have settled and I'm going to try to compute something over it. This is kind of like OLAP workload usually doesn't scale very well on transactional databases, but people kind of don't use data lakes for this because they lack these kind of unique key constraints and other database properties. Um, this, so going back to data lake architecture, it is not enough that you simply ingest the raw data quickly. Uh, typically you'll have a multi-stage ETL uh, scheduled by something like uh, Viper, say, or Airflow, but um, in this case, for example, you have raw trips, all you want to do is standardize the fare to some currency and build a derived, uh, derived table. So you need to make sure you can also uh, you know, going back to our first picture, right? What was a single step process is like two stages now. So that adds latency. You need to figure out a way to keep this delay table uh, up to date, fresh, and then, you know, we are warehouse up to date basically from the raw data. And uh, there are some scaling challenges here, which is, you know, um, which trips do you, how do you, how do you derive this data? If you keep recomputing, you can waste a lot of uh, resources. You have to figure out some way to intelligently recompute your derived data based on what's exactly changed in the source data. Just like I guess I'm basically thinking through this. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Now let's get to the lower level infra, right? Like small files. Small files are a big problem uh, because they cost a lot of overhead to query engines. And then they stress the file system metadata. Um, like even even uh, HDFS is famous for it, but even on cloud stores, if you have too many small files, it's going to stress the directory listing and stuff. Oh, sure, like big files, uh, it's easier said than done. If you write larger files, you're now taking on a lot of like ingest latency. Like you need to balance these trade-offs very carefully. And typically, people say, okay, let's just the files, but that's like bandit for bulletproof because you end up writing small files anywhere, expose them to the queries, and then the query agency anyway suffers, all you're doing is later come back and rewrite them for kind of like, you know, safekeeping or something. This is, this process in general is not very consistent or standardized, uh, this whole management, and this is the thing that you have to spend time at when you're definitely gonna scale it to like a multi-petabyte data set. And uh, again, uh, you know, your ingestion queries, everything you need to talk to is like DFS. And then you have to list folders. You have to be careful about listing them single threaded or multi threaded. Say, let's say the chip is name node. If you go full on multi threaded, you can actually slam the name node. Uh, in some cases, if you don't do parallel, the, the planning can be slow. Um, then there are all these like gotchas, right? There is no append in cloud store. This has eventual consistency. You think it's a rename, but it's a copy. Uh, then you need to do large directory listings, the name order button like, you need to deal with a whole bunch of these things to actually scale a uh, data lake as well. And then uh, the, the second part, which is sort of uh, data marks, right? So typically, you transform data in a data lake and send it to a data mark. So in our case, Vertica, mostly people in cloud, I've seen like some users uh, do uh, Redshift. Um, these are often specialized databases. 
So the point I'm trying to get at is, uh, and also sorry, like you know, in case of say Michelangelo, uh, we compute machine learning features. We you know ship them out to Cassandra, or some online serving store. So the batch dog that computes this these derived data uh, tables in the lake also needs to sync incrementally to the data mart. Uh, this you you can't like you know so even if you do full batch recomputes in your data lake, you can't just do it on another uh, like a Vertica or a, a online database because you're gonna affect their performance as well, right? So you need a way to incrementally aggress to the slower uh, Cassandra or like the, the smaller data mart while you are uh, still computing your EDL results. Uh, like everyone's dealt with this now, by now. Uh, you need delete records, correct the data, you need this is not. So when I started on Udi, uh, so I came from a database background previously, small detour, I worked on database application and build a water model engine just like a key value store. So, but when I entered this, it was like, oh, mutability is a no-no. And then quickly, <laughs> in like two years, everyone's figuring out how to mutate and delete your data on data lakes. So anyway, uh, you need to do efficient deletes, right? Like, you, this is like a needle in a haystack problem. Uh, you have so much data, if you want to delete, if you're scanning through the entire data set to delete, uh, it's going to take a, for, it's going to be inefficient and take a while, right? And then you can't suddenly, I've seen people say, oh, let's stick it in a, a database. And no, like you still have to have your data lake optimized for OLAP scans, but you need to support some sort of faster deletes on the other side. And this is what it takes to build a data lake today. Um, and you also need to be able to propagate these uh, deleted records downstream. Uh, it's not enough to simply correct it on the raw data sets. Right? Finally, uh, late data. So this is a reality uh, with uh, everything is like mobile right now. Uh, so you know, uh, so I also work on say uh, mobile network optimization with Uber. So some cases. You can log a message on the phone's disk, uh, an event, it can be delayed for hours because there's no network. But so your data like habitually uh, arrives late. It can be minutes, hours, or days late. Let's take a credit card transaction which is gonna settle and then only later come for a trip that you say it took a day before. Um, so assuming that your data is implicitly complete, that is typically how batch data architectures uh, at least where, uh, they just you know compute partition by partition, day by day, and then once they've computed their data set, they assume nothing's changed. Uh, like, you know, I, 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 because they think it's data at rest, data is never at rest. There's only portion of data that's at rest. There's always an active window which is changing actively, right? So, again, going back to this, uh, you need to build first class audit logging and understand when data arrives into your uh, kind of like data like table partitions and uh, understand sort of you know when is it safe to ignore some late data versus when is it you know some say we are computing fares it's probably not safe to ignore a late update to a fare but in some other cases maybe like you need you need some auditing to understand all this so with this let's Quickly, like you know, five slides. A little bit talk about what what Hudi is. And, uh, so, at a very high level, um, Hudi basically lets you consume uh, change even from databases or Kafka or even other Hudi data sets. Build a Hudi data set, uh, which is like an analytical data set on top of either cloud or HDFS, essentially in even Ignite or something that lets you write with. The, the Hadoop file system API, right? And then it exposes three views uh, to read this data out, which I will get into uh, in the next slides. And all of these views can be accessed by high Spark Presto and uh, like you know your normal, more, more most popular query engines that you have outside. Um, on the writer side, when we actually ingest and store the data, so. Huni provides snapshot isolation between writers and queries. 
It provides support for upsurge and with some pluggable indexing uh, built into the system. Uh, it can autonomously publish data with the ability to roll, roll the data back as well. Uh, so it essentially gives you kind of single table transactions, if you will. And it also supports things like save points, where you can say, I'm going to take a few save points every day, and then if you know the data messes up after that, you can restore your data set to that point. And it manages these low-level things like file sizes and layouts and using, you know, it, it takes more heuristics and stats when you're writing and then tries to always write well-sized files for them. And then it supports a near real time ingestion where we asynchronously compact old and the new data, as I gave into this more. Uh, and then on top of it, it has a timeline and a metadata, timing metadata to tra try track lineage, like you know, any write, which file is it touching, why is it touching, you know, what's the offset, everything is tracked. So you get essentially like a, a read a lot uh, for your uh, data set. So on the view side, right, we support three logical views. So we ingest it once and we support three kind of logical views. Um, the first is the read optimized view. Uh, the, the name comes because it, it it, it replaces your plain Apache parquet tables that you may have today, and it provides excellent columnar query performance. All the queries that you run, uh, the goal here was uh, all three engines, Hadoop, Spark, uh, Presto, have their own I.O. paths for reading parquet. So this guarantees that we are, we are going to exercise that optimized parquet reading path on all these engines. So it's, it's heavily read optimized. Um, there's an incremental view, which essentially taps into this redo log that I mentioned and can give you kind of uh, change logs for the data set. So it's an equivalent is, it's like a Kafka stream of changes that happen to your Udi data set. So you can use that to build streaming uh, or like, you know, like more incremental pipelines uh, in near real time fashion as opposed to doing purely batch process. I'll get into this. And then there is a near real time view, which essentially we quickly ingest data in a, uh, in a row based, uh, you know, agro format, and then uh, asynchronously compact it into parquet. Um, so the near real time view, in some cases, uh, okay, uh, at least for a certain class of users, uh, they need access to the freshest data possible, and then you can actually query this table or view, and then it's going to like merge the parquet and the average data on the fly, and it's going to give you the freshest data possible uh, with an additional uh, compute class for the merge. So it essentially gives you all three views. You can use whichever view you want based on your needs. Um, okay, primitive wise, high level, right? We just added two major things. One is the ability to upsert a data set. And then on the other side, like I mentioned, given a start and an end, uh, like timestamps, we can pull efficiently only the records that were changed within those two timestamps. So just like, again, it's like taking an Kafka topic by saying start offset, end offset. So, at Uber, our uh, three parts are entire data lake, like you have thousands of tables, and then we can just more than a trillion records a day. And now, let's come back. So now we understand what Udi is. Let's consider this architecture where we basically pipe all our database change logs into, and then external sources, events, everything is into like, uh, say, Kafka. And then now we just build a data lake powered by Udi where the raw and derived tables are all uh, you know, Udi data sets. Now let's see what this architecture uh, looks like looks like and how it helps us meet those zillion things I complained about before. So first of all, uh, you can do incremental database change logs in two steps. The first step, Kudi itself doesn't help. Essentially, you can extract new changes that were made to that user table that we saw using something like Scoop or use your favorite, uh, you know, data integration tool to kind of like pull it into a Kafka topic or something. Then you can use the uh, like a Hootie Spark uh, data source to simply like ingest them like how you would do a normal Spark data set by specifying your keys and a bunch of uh, you know a few fields there. 
uh, this can uh, this essentially updates the data and hides all the complexity from you. And uh, this is going to be you know order of magnitudes more efficient than bulk ingesting your database. And duplicate events, same thing. We have a tool called a built-in called Delta Streamer, which essentially reads from a Kafka topic. Uh, it it built-in works with the Confluent schema registry, uh, and then you can also provide your own way for how you want to read your schema. And then it can essentially dedo this before it, it writes it in with with minimal overhead. Uh, so. Moving on, so any data that you write using any of these methods, so we saw one example for observe and one example for kind of you know filter and inserts. Right? Um, so all of them are multi-row commits. So none of so if they fail in between the like the mask from the queries, and like I mentioned, we have rollback and save point support. All of the timeline is tracked in a special dot ruby folder. And uh, these things are instantaneous. So any write is marked with a timestamp, and then the query data set moves from one action to the next consistent action. We provide MVCC based isolation between the queries and the ingestion, and also between the ingestion and the background component. So something that we are working on in the future is to provide unlimited kind of timeline loopback. Right now, our timeline is backed by that folder. So at some point, we have to kind of archive older actions into another thing for the sake of listing cost. But we are working on providing sort of unlimited loopback if, if that's useful. And the other notion uh, here in Puri is it, it embraces like a, a, an explicit key, so which basically lets us uh, kind of enforce uh, unique key constraints very easily. Um, so any ingested record is tagged into like a insert or an update, and we provide interfaces to kind of merge updates with each other. So previously, I think it's part data console. I think we we had a talk where one of the teams was using this merge to kind of implement incremental uh, percentiles using t digest. So so you can implement pretty pretty com complex merges using this. And then we support a few kind of in indexing schemes. Indexing scheme essentially says this record is an insert or an update. So there's a built-in indexing scheme which uses bloom, bloom filters and range information for the files. We also uh, use uh, HBase index, uh, which is more like an uh, index that sits outside. Um, so the goal here is this case with the long-term data growth and the indexing can actually handle data skews that, that may have in your workload automatically. And uh, yeah, the other thing that some people have asked for is can I, uh, you know, instead of the merges specifying through an interface that you write, can I do it by a SQL? That's something that, that we are thinking about. All right, so. On the incremental ETL pipelines, right? So if you remember the old, uh, uh, what I was saying before, uh, the, the, the strips, and then we standardize the FAR, and we have a derived standardized strips table. So you can actually, uh, what Puri lets you do from the incremental chain stream is you can, it brings streaming APIs onto the data lake. So you need not only always program with like batch fashion, but you can also, just like how you write a streaming job, Tailor the uh, you know raw trips table uh, beginning for you know all data after 8 a.m. and then you know do your transformation convert this data frame to a result data data stream and then absurd it back. So if you're familiar, if you're written streaming jobs is very similar to consuming from Kafka and then you know using some stateful uh, you know if you write a flink job or something to do a stateful raw db based uh, state update. And so it, it basically lets you do uh, some of this, and for a large number of row-based ETLs, this is actually way more efficient than you know just recomputing the last one day or a few hours of data over and over again. So some things that we're working on again are we want to be able to provide more watermark APIs. We we have all the metadata right now around arrival tracking, but we don't necessarily expose them in a very a meaningful way. So we're, we're also thinking about how best to do that. All right, 
onto file sizing. So one trade, one uh, design choice that we made was we always wanted to enforce a file size on write. So essentially, we wanted to keep file sizes as close to possible to a configured uh, maximum file size that we set. So if we, for example, uh, at Uber, we try to align this with our HDFS block size. So we always try to have, say, 256 MB or 1 GB uh, party files. And we also support uh, near real-time block ingest. Uh, like I mentioned, so we quickly ingest to um, like an append to a log uh, in the Agro format, and then we let an async compactor you know merge the the log uh, Agro data with uh, and then produce like new parquet files all in a consistent fashion. Uh, this is so that you can actually decide how different strategies for kind of deciding. Like say say you have a lot of late arriving data to older partitions, you can choose to delay the compaction of those and then compact the recent partitions sooner. So it gives you that flexibility as well. So that also lets us to uh, enables us to write larger files because we can amortize the cost of writing across many compactions. And Oh, sorry. So the one thing that we're working on is support for splitting and collapsing of files in a, in a more flexible way. And then right now we are also looking into tuning some of these, auto tuning some of these things like compression ratio. These are constants. We have like constants that may work for most people, but we want to actually tune them based on the data sets themselves and try to make this part as self-managed as possible because this is the hard part to tune per data set. You, you never want to make it if you start. <laughs> and uh, we have embedded spot timing server. So what we do is um, we have a thread that runs uh, embedded in uh, the Spark driver. So Scudi writer itself runs as a Spark bag, and then all these things happen from the driver. And then the executors actually uh, query the state from the driver via RPC. Um, so this means there are no listings from Spark executors at all. All this thing happens in a single place. And when we try, when we we are you know we are working on either uh, running this as a standalone uh, service, so that no listing actually all these things actually come to the standalone server across even the query side. Uh, so this is a precursor for that. And uh, the second point was, so we are moving towards also uh, getting our data streamer to run in a continuous fashion. So what that means is. You want to do a write that, and then the driver already caches using RocksDB the, the state of the data set, and then it's going to keep incrementally updating itself with the writes that you made. So you actually, over a long period of time, you only go and list the file system when your driver has to start on another node. And uh, again, so we have these uh, consistency guards that we implemented, which masks all the eventual consistency problems that we see in S3. And uh, our design uh, does no uh, moving, uh, or like renaming. It does in-place writing, and then it also handles tricky um, sort of like uh, spark stage failures and, and whatnot. And yeah, like I mentioned, we once we stabilize this uh, in, in our first Apache release, I think we're going to be working on pulling this into its own service, which all the queries and everything can intercept, and we'll be actually uh, be able to do far more fancy things even on the query optimization side. That, that's at least the plan. All right. So again, here, uh, like I mentioned, uh, incremental pull. So what we what if you write your derived uh, tables as a Hoodie data dataset, what this gives you is you can keep running your ETL jobs, and then this derived table you can still incrementally pull. And then you can, you know, uh, write to Cassandra or uh, Vertica or, or your data lake. This essentially decouples the ETL writing from the transport of the, you know, the derived data ETL results out of the data lake. So you can throttle, retry, rewind all of this independently from the ETL job, which, which essentially at Uber, if you look at it, uh, the ingestion and we call this dispersal, the reverse of ingestion are handled by a platform team because you need to interface across database, the database and everything. 
but the the sent like anyone any engineer uh, in the you know the sort the diet on the Raj showed can actually write a derivative data. So we kind of decouple uh, that and we don't put like engineers uh, expect expect every engineer to know how efficiently to write to Cassandra. Right? So it helps us uh, decouple those. The one thing is we our data streamer tool has focused a lot more on ingestion than uh, dispersal. So that's something that we would like to uh, I think support in the future. So we support fast, soft, lots of deletes, soft deletes, hard deletes, and uh, if you uh, soft deletes, essentially you set the thing to null. So again, thanks to the incremental for any, if you go back to the previous uh, ETL, incremental ETL job, right, you will set a trip to null, and then it's going to propagate downstream, and then set it to null automatically in your derivative table. So we can actually propagate these uh, soft deletes very easily just using these two very powerful primitives. And then hard deletes just, uh, you know, has a special record payload. You say these cases, these keys just skip and then get rid of the data set. And then uh, compaction eventually will make sure, you know, on, on they, they are, they're actually physically deleted. And then we have indexing. So, um, so we use, like I mentioned, uh, we have a notion of explicit key, and we try to index the key using blue printers and the uh, range information. And this is typically seven to ten times faster than simply taking your input and spark joining against the data out there. So, like I think that's one of the questions Chester often asks me. That is probably why we made that design choice. Um, and. Uh, I think uh, on this we probably have to uh, provide better standards tooling for doing doing deletes. So you can do it right now, but it's, it's a little bit of you have to you know mess around the documentation, find out all this kind of stuff. We'll improve that. Um, again, so this is something that uh, Wangle is doing, which is uh, you know with the timeline we have a CLI, and if you poke around, you can actually identify how late your data actually is because you can. Since we have metadata on what partitions each write is touching, you can see that in each each write historically, which partitions are touched. Is it the like you know writes coming in 10 a.m. Are they touching 8 a.m., 7 a.m. partitions, 6 a.m. Right. So you with this you can obtain some at least vague bounds on lateness of your data, and then. Typically, when you're again uh, doing these uh, uh, derived data jobs, if you're joining or aggregating, what happens is, say you are you're computing some counts, uh, you you think you're you're done computing, say 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., but at 10 a.m. you got some late data into the old window. So now you need to recompute, right? So if you know these bounds, what you can do, uh, which is cool with uh, something like Hudi, is you can always pull last two commits instead of say last, last two hours worth of commits instead of just the last commit and you know sort of like flexibly rewind and recompute uh, which kind of uh, is still much more efficient than say okay every uh, two times a day I'm going to recompute last seven days worth of this is. Like it's still like much much more efficient uh, than, than doing that. Yeah the future I think uh, the, the, like our goal is we can bring in something like Beam, which has support for watermarks. So the thing is, this is all is still kind of like you know very uh, manual, like right. The point there is, we need a framework where we can implement watermarks and things like that. Uh, so the idea is, uh, over time, we can first instead of being uh, relying solely on a Spark DAG, we can we can replace that with something like Beam, and then hide Spark and think downstream. Something like Beam as a framework level has good support for watermarks and late data, and you can, uh, you know, say when you want to trigger your uh, pipeline and stuff. So I think these, in combination with a framework like Beam, we, we think would be like very, very powerful. All right. So we uh, we've been so we're open source. We've been open source for since 2017, I think, and we are committed. Uh, so we started this project because. We hit those things, and then data lakes are still very. Everyone tries to build one, but they're still very unstandardized, and uh, 
we are we want to see if there is interest in a uh, open sort of vendor neutral way to build your data lake because this data lake usually is all of your organization's data. So what we believe in it, it should be in sort of like open source uh, formats, which you should be readable through multiple standard tools. So we're very committed to that. That's why we keep supporting like multiple query engines and make sure this data is, remains open that, that you just free. So we've been uh, supporting our community for more than two years now. Uh, we are on, we entered the Apache Incubator uh, earlier this year. Our first Apache release is uh, sort of imminent in the next one month. And there are other people outside uh, using Huli. There are some I can't say here. Uh, and then, like, what we, the interesting thing we did was Uber, we use HDFS. But everyone else outside can be running it on cloud. So we learned a ton uh, from our community as well around cloud issues and sort of like, you know, what GCP does versus what S3 does. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in this, if you're building a data lake, I mean, check us out. The issues file us, we're, we're very really responsive. And uh, I just want to leave you with, okay, one more reprocessing. Uh, So few things that we are working on. So one main thing has been like bootstrapping uh, tables into Woody with the indexing benefit. So right now what you can do is you can migrate your data set. You can say, okay, you take last two days of uh, partitions and say last n partitions, I'm going to rewrite to Woody. The old data can be non Woody, it's fine, it still works. Um, but I think uh, people like Chester want the indexing benefits as well as we don't want to rewrite the data. We're actually, I think, finally figured out I have really like two, two, two kind of things to check. I think we, we have a way to do that now. Hopefully we can land some time in H2. And uh, like we want to also provide more convenient tooling rather than the migration guide. Um, and then uh, again, stand, we want to like move towards a standalone tangent server where we want to eliminate file, file listings from the query planning on both the institution side. And uh, we also want to be able to track column level statistics for also query planning. So those are things that, that we, we focus a lot more on the writing ingestion side, uh, the compaction, and we are, we are further along on that. This is something that we are beginning to look at as well. And uh, yeah, so one thing that we want to do is, uh, even though, say, people are happy with, say, 1 GB, and then suddenly, like, when you normally write it, and then what if we want it to be 4 GB or 8 GB for last year's data? So we want to be able to support more smarter sort of uh, file sizing and reclustering of the data. Uh, that again ties in with something like standalone, uh, like a timeline server. You need, as, as long as we have that, we, we'll be able to do much more cooler sort of storage uh, features. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, any questions? All right, uh, I'll ask the first question, sorry. So uh, this is exciting to see so many features uh, in the hoodie, I mean, I'm very excited. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, if you're already using, you know, the, for the legal compliant GDR, so if we have this uh, hoodie or implemented GDR, it's so easy, right? So, <laughs> but uh, I have uh, two questions. So, you know, hoodie, take a snapshot to, to compare the things. So how to optimize it? So from that, uh, the, uh, the Netflix uh, iceberg also has uh, used a snapshot into helping to improve the high spark optimization. In, they, they claim that they can increase the current performance to about 10 times. So, so you, you maybe you want to comment on that. And then my second question is obvious. Databricks just open source uh, you know, the Delta, which is doing a similar type of thing. So this certain part doing similar type of things. So, uh, which I also want you to comment on that. So this is the, like a master question. <laughs> All right, so I think this has been, I think, uh, I'm actually, by the way, first of all, I'm like super happy uh, because when we started this, uh, in 2016, I wrote this O'Reilly blog post that, okay, this, this bunch of these things feel wrong. Uh, it, I was very lonely, now I have like two other projects, so it, it also validates some of the things that, that we've been doing. So I'm like super happy that there are other, other projects and we're looking at it. So now, coming back to uh, Iceberg. So um, Iceberg actually does not hand, like support updates. Uh, so Iceberg, my understanding, 
and also like Ryan basically essentially said the same thing. So we had an Adobe meet up with high blasted Hoodie and then Ryan basically said, oh, an iceberg and Ryan said, okay, iceberg doesn't do updates. Iceberg is trying to be a very viable uh, sort of high meta store replacement, which can be uh, much better at query planning. Uh, and that's how I see it right now. Uh, you can, so what, like you, I mean, I, I think at least like what Iceberg from Iceberg uh, view, you can implement things like we on top of uh, primitives provided by Iceberg, but uh, for, when, when I look at it, uh, copy on write, yes. But if, you, if I look at uh, Udi itself, things like async compaction and things like that, it is not very easy to sort of, those design have to be, uh, the metadata and the storage layout has to be tied in one place. Uh, so I, those, I think, so right now, between Iceberg and Udi, I think there is actually a, we can literally, even Udi data sets, we can write additional Iceberg uh, metadata to help query planning if needed. Right. I think it is very orthogonal at this point. But you do have a plan for that? I have a plan for that, but I think, uh, cop and again, copy and write, it is definitely doable. Right? So so for something that I didn't cover here, which, which we covered in a lot of our previous talks, so if you're simply writing parquet files and versioning parquet files, it is super simple. Right? Every, every, every time I know what has changed, we'll write to iceberg. We can definitely take that, uh, and if that's something people need, we can definitely do it. Uh, something like merge and read, I really do not know. Because we have another log file, and then, uh, you know, the compactor is like, you know, asynchronously compact, and the query needs to understand, uh, you know, the iceberg doesn't understand delta files, for example, right now, right? So there are gaps in there, so I don't know about the real time view, for example, uh, but definitely something like incremental view, maybe, but definitely the read optimized view, uh, we can do. Kudi, uh, Kudi right on this side, and then the, like, you know, a parquet table backed by iceberg on the other side would be a very good thing, actually. Uh, yeah, if there's more interest, we're happy to take, take something. It's, it's actually not a large change. Um, Delta, Delta's more interesting because Delta also tries to do updates uh, on the writer side and also does tries to do some of the uh, query side optimizations. So again, uh, I haven't uh, I haven't seen it because I think they're still open sourcing the update parts. Uh, I, I still don't know what shape it will be there, so I don't know what to say there. But very high level, there are some differences. So Kudi can work with Spark, Presto, and Hive. Uh, like we are, someone's working on Impala support. So we we are trying to not be, uh, we're trying to uh, like be a polyglot uh, query engine, um, at least on the, the incremental and the read optimized views. Um, from, the, the other thing from what I see with Delta is, um, I think they have good SQL support, which is actually cool uh, to do, but I don't know how you can enforce primary key constraints using uh, without an explicit notion of a key, uh, you can merge data. So if, if that's important, I don't know how you do something like that. The, the other thing is, again, uh, near real time ingest, right? Uh, Delta, from what I read, looked at the talk and what I read, again, feels like Kudi copy and write. Uh, so I don't know if it, like, they're going to do. Uh, like near real time ingest, log compaction, things like that. So it remains to be seen. I don't want to comment on it, like you know, um, without fully knowing what shape it's going to be in. But these are my my sort of high level thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting topic. Delta is so important in this. So on the query side, you mentioned you are doing joins from the aggregation. So this is more and more goes to the territory of Spark. So at the end, you're going to replace or complement Spark? Uh, no, actually our, our, our goal is to simply uh, not just Spark, but we want the query is to be queryable through Hive, Spark, and Presto. We are actually not in the business of even, uh, you know, actually implementing query engines. 
Kuni uh, works mostly in the data plane. Kuni, uh, for example, can give you uh, metadata information that let you uh, window your data. Like for some, so, like that. That's for example something that, that I see as a key difference between something like Delta and Kuni is like the incremental form. Uh, so we write metadata to track if at the record level when it made its way into the system. So you can implement windowing on top of your data using Spark or Hive or Beam or whatever. So we are strictly only playing in the, the, the data space, not really the, the tooling on the frameworks. That, does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I just got worried when you mentioned joins and no filter. Uh. Oh, I see, I see, I see. No, the, the, the main thing is there is still no good tool to safely perform joins. In between two streams of data, at least. Okay. Good job. Uh, quick question. Uh, how do I see the bottlenecks of coding? Uh, like, is there a metric server behind it? Uh, so, uh, I didn't see that. Uh, this, uh, thank you. Right. Um, I think uh, on the on the site, uh, we, there's an administration performance page which uh, will, uh, lists go over some of that. Um, so, first of all, the Kodi writing is a Spark job. So the Spark UA does a very good job of actually showing stragglers, bottlenecks, and everything. Um, the second is we also support built-in metrics that you can emit to kind of graphite or something but that will let you visualize things like how many files were written this run, you know, how many records ingested, how long did the indexing take, how long did the storage take, things like that. Okay. Other questions? All right. Give a round of applause to him. <laughs> I know it's kind of really great that you got everybody here to stay in three talks, but I, I thought this was so important to get all these great talks together. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you for the speakers. Thank uh, also, thank you for our uh, audio video engineers and Ray and uh, others in the back. And, uh, we need